Good evening. This is the June 21st, 2018 meeting of the Northampton City Council. My name is Ryan O'Donnell. I'm the City Council President. I will be presiding tonight. Let me first note the audio and video recording of these proceedings, and we will begin, as we always do, with a period of public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to speak on any issue you wish. There are only a couple of rules. First, please keep your comments to three minutes or less, and also realize that this is your time to give your opinion to us, and we're prohibited from exchanging, going in a back and forth with you. Um, and this is to make sure everyone is heard fairly and has equal time. So let me start with my sign-up sheet, and after that I'll go to anyone who hasn't signed up. And the first person is Mr. Ken Pratt. And Mr. Pratt, if you would give your name and address for the record, please, and the floor is yours. My name is Kenneth Richard Pratt. I live in apartment 31981 Conch Street. I am a lieutenant commander in the United States Navy, retired. I have been a citizen of the Valley for decades, just about. I am here because my heart moves me about the, uh, what I read of the resolution regarding um, this is unethical, immoral, it's un-American. I did not go to Nam for this. And I especially am worried. I hear that there are about 2,000 children involved. If you do basic numbers, that means that approximately 200 of those children have some type of disability from learning disabilities and retardation to mobility challenges. I imagine that people both pro and con are forgetting about whatever number of people with disabilities are uh, involved. I think my time's up. Please don't forget us. Sorry, you, the you still have some more time if Although I'm not sure how much, but would you like to finish your thought? Okay. <laughs> we appreciate your comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Chelsea Klein, please. Good evening, everyone. I'm Chelsea Klein. I live at 42 Terry Street in Northampton. I am here to support the resolution. I applaud you for doing this work and for taking a stand against this insane moment in American history. Um, I appreciated your language saying that it's immoral, that it's abhorrent, that it's cruel, inhumane. I completely agree with all of those sentiments. Um, I did want to ask, and I know you, you're not responding or, you know, I don't know what your process is, but I'm, I'm interested if this is to prevent this from continuing to happen or if you're also advocating for a reunification of family and children. I wasn't totally clear on that, the way that it was written, so I wanted to point that out that we, you may want to strengthen the language about the, the system that as it stands now with the families that are caught up in the system, perhaps they could be reunified together. So thank you for your work. Thank you very much for those comments. Um, I'm not sure that this one to me is illegible. Um, it might be Letitia. Oh, Letitia. Letitia Ward. Letitia Ward, please. <laughs> I'm nervous. Hi, my, na my name is Leticia Ward, and I live on 155 Pleasant Street in Northampton. And I and I approve for the motion for the for the people in Northampton for the Northampton for the for the resolution. I think for me, I think we need to support this because I think people need to be with their family families because families is more important than than being se separated. Because I th I think people should not like against like for like our president because that's not a right thing to do i think we need to support and i think we need to respect other people's di dif differences so th thank you very much thank thank you very much for those comments we appreciate that uh and next i'll go to alex jarrett Alex Jarrett, 8th High Street, Florence. First, I also want to speak in favor of the resolution to end the separation of immigrant children from their parents. 
Um, and I want to talk about the affordability of living in Northampton. Um, first, my story. Of, I've lived here for 20 years. 13 years ago, uh, I bought a two-family house in Florence with three other people. Some of that was out of necessity, but it turned out to be one of the best decisions that I've made in terms of creating community, and if there was ever a problem, there are four of us to work on it. Um, so since I moved here about 20 years ago, rent and housing costs have doubled versus inflation at one and, a, one and a half times. My current housemates, who we charge rent to based only on what our expenses are rather than the market rate, would pay double the rent they pay to us if they move elsewhere in Northampton. Uh, many people I know can't afford to rent or buy here anymore. Many of the fellow worker owners of my business, pedal people, uh, have to commute in. Um, so there are many good projects. They are not, but they aren't enough. The council needs to do everything in its power to work on this, to change an unjust class system, and figure out what we can do on a local level first. So here are some ideas. Some of these are not currently legal under state law, um, but the council could pass resolutions and we can lobby. You could create legal structures. You could encourage the formation of community land trusts. These allow people to own their homes, but a nonprofit trust owns the land under the house and leases it to them for as long as they or their descendants live there. Uh, limited equity housing cooperatives, where residents can own their own units, make decisions together, gain equity, and it limits the price for future residents. Taxes. We could tax vacation and second homes, extremely large homes, out of state owners at a higher rate, pass on the savings to everyone else could expand the property tax work-off program to people of low income in addition to seniors and veterans. You could give tax breaks, breaks based on income and total assets. You could share. Uh, the population of Northampton is about the same as it was in 1950, yet there are so many more houses. And encouraging people to share their homes would effectively increase the housing stock, it would also bring in extra income, build community, could provide companionship and assistance for older or disabled residents. We could do a rent program uh, <clears throat> where property owners pledge to rent their properties based on their expenses, including their labor, and not on the market price. Um, people with money to give back could charge less than their expenses. This could be similar to the pace car program where people pledge uh, to drive the speed limit. Imagine if it was cool to say, I'm renting my apartment for $300 below market. Another, someone else could say, I'm renting it for $350. Um, or we could also consider rent regulations that restrict the rate at which rents may rise. And finally, zoning uh, could allow mobile homes, trailer parks, and tiny homes. So more ideas and a lot more detail on my website, which is shareit.org. That's S-H-A-R-E-T-T. -T, and I have comment, too, for the council. Or Would there. you like to submit that for the record? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Those comments. Um, next up, Richard Abusa. Thank you. My name is Richard Abusa. I live in Florence, and my business has been downtown at 181 Main Street for over 40 years. When we see government officials in Washington evade our laws, subvert due process, and play fast and loose with the facts and truth, we are saddened and outraged, as you hear tonight. The question before City Council now is, will all of us ignore parallel behavior when it happens here in Northampton? and where the city's council's legal role is being circumvented and due process is being ignored. The law and the facts in this miscarriage are simple and straightforward. However, just like in Washington, there have been repeated efforts to muddy and confuse the facts. Here are the facts. Over 50 years ago, Cracker Barrel Alley and the entire Masonic Street parking lot, including Cracker Barrel Alley, was taken by eminent domain by a city council vote for a specific purpose. That sole purpose was that the land was taken to be used as a car parking lot. And the taking had two access routes to the lot, one of which is Cracker Barrel Alley. Because taking property by eminent domain is such a serious use of governmental powers, there are strict requirements and procedures for that action. And those requirements are for before it happens and those requirements continue on in perpetuity governing the way land is taken, what is used for eminent domain. For over 50 years, Cracker Barrel Alley has continued to be used for the purpose for which it was taken, for cars to access the Masonic Street parking lot. 
Under Massachusetts law, chapter 40, section 15, there are strict legal requirements before there can be any change in purpose in land taken by eminent domain. Under that law, you as city council must formally approve any change in purpose by a two-thirds majority. It is significant that the law requires a supermajority vote as changing the purpose is a serious act under the law, not to be done casually, lightly, or by a devious route. Yes, the statute is clear and this very same statute was cited by the city as applying to Cracker Barrel Alley in a letter to me. The only issue being muddied is something that your common sense tells you is very simple. You don't need a lawyer to tell you that taking an alley that has been on the city maps and continuously used by cars and changing it into a pedestrian and bike path is a change in purpose. It is obvious and it is really just that simple. When you stop cars from using the alley, it's not the same purpose and trying to make the case that it is the same purpose when you are blocking cars from using this alley to get to a municipal parking lot is absurd. If there is an obvious change of use limiting this historic parking use by cars, then the legal requirements of Massachusetts Chapter 40, Section 15 apply and must be followed. The statute requires that it comes before you, the City Council. In fact, you should have been a part of this process right from the start, but you as our elected representatives were ignored. What can and should you do? You should respectfully ask that any action taken to block Cracker Barrel Alley be halted until you can assess your proper role. You can pass a resolution asking that, and while it may not be legally binding, that resolution puts the city on notice that you want the requirements of the law examined. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeremy Whalen, please. Hello, Jeremy Willen, uh, brand spanking new resident of 31 Union Street in Ward 3. Uh, I am also a teacher at Northampton High School, and as such, I have a kind of visual, um, a visual demonstration of what I'm going to be talking about. There we go. Firstly, I would like to applaud you all for your hard work in helping make Northampton the vibrant community that it is today. It has been a goal of mine to live in the city that I invest in educationally, economically, and emotionally and on, on a daily basis. I am excited to, give in, to get involved in helping to improve our city in a variety of productive and innovative ways. As an educator, I want to bring to your attention what I feel is a gro the growing cognitive dissonance between the perception of Northampton's educational well-being and the reality of our position uh, with respect to the rest of the state. In conversations with individuals <coughs> in Northampton and surrounding communities, the general impression is that Northampton's economic affluence extends into its educational system and, consequently, into budgetary items such as teacher salary. Taking a look at the most recent data made, a, made available by the Department of Elementary and Secondary, Secondary Education, however, Northampton Public Schools ranks the 22nd lowest for average teacher pay. Smith Vocational ranks 19th. You can see all the um, public schools on this. Comparing this to our neighbor communities, Northampton fall, falls short in adequately <coughs> addressing the, this income disparity. East Hampton, for example, ranks 38 districts above us, amounting to over 5,000 more per teacher on average annually. While the economic situation regarding our public schools is exacerbated by the siphoning of funds from nearby charter schools and other such uh, economic influences, this is just one component of a larger institutional problem that we face as a city. Consequently, the district suffers by losing some truly great educators in, uh, in need of better wages. We have seen movements across the nation successfully highlighting the need for more support of our school systems and those that work there every day to educate our youth. And I believe it is time for Northampton to step up and be a le leader on the national stage on this issue, as it is done on a multitude of other issues in the past. I also want to thank uh, Councilman Nash for responding to my email as well. I, I sent him that. And uh, I, like I said, I thank you for everything you do. I think that this is a, uh, some, a cultural hurdle that we need to, get to go over. And I just wanted to make everybody be aware of the circumstances in which we find ourselves. So thank you. Thank you very much. I don't have to enter that into the record. No, no. OK. Gonna, I'll take this home with me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for those comments. Is there anyone else who has not signed up or would like to speak? Yes, sir.
Good afternoon, my name is Jim Page. <coughs> I live at 46 Evergreen Road in Leeds, Mass. And I just wanted to stand up and thank this council for taking up its time and its energy on the resolution before us for those uh, for the children that are suffering in, uh, all our, in our border cities. And uh, I su obviously support this resolution and thank you for supporting it and appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to give public comment? No? Going once, going twice? All right, we will convene, and I'd ask for a roll of the council. Here. President. <coughs> Here. Here. President. Here. 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 Okay. We are convened. Uh, beg the council's indulgence to reorder some of the things on the agenda. And no sooner are we convened, but we will recess for the Committee on Finance. Mm -hmm. Laura, would you call the roll, please? Here. Present. Present. Here. Uh, the first item for tonight uh, are approving minutes, both of May 3rd and May 17th, 2018. To approve. Second. Any corrections or changes? Hearing none, then all in favor of approval, please say aye. 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 All right, and then we have some new financial orders to deal with tonight. Um, the, the first one is 18.124 in order to grant a utility easement under the Masonic Street parking lot. Order that whereas National Grid seeks an easement to place utility lines under the Masonic Street parking lot in order to allow replacement of windows at 32 Masonic Street where the power lines are too close to the building and whereas National Grid and the city have negotiated a proposed easement to allow National Grid to bury its lines at its sole cost and expense while retraining maximum flexibility should the city decide to redevelop the parking lot. Now, therefore, it be ordered that the City Council authorizes the conveyance to National Grid for the consideration of $1, a permanent perpetual right and easement to install, construct, reconstruct, repair, replace, add to and maintain and operate lines for the transmission of electrical current and for the transmission of intelligence in, on, under, and over the premises known as a Masonic Street parking lot being parcel 247 on assessor map 31D. Do we have a motion to find it? Make a motion. Second? Second. And uh, questions for the mayor on this one? The um, resolution explains it. Uh, National Grid has been trying to come up with a way to bury some lines that, um, that run down Masonic Street. There's a, a condo building there that has been doing construction and renovation, replacing windows, and um, the lines are so close to the building that they can't safely get under them, and they They've been wanting to bury them anyway. So anyway, we've worked out an agreement um, where we will grant them an easement uh, to, to bury it underground. Um, we do have the ability and option, if should we make any changes to the lot, to have them move them. That's that's guaranteed as part of the easement. Um, and obviously, it's all at at, uh, at the expense of National Grid. So um, it was a uh, long negotiation with uh, grid lawyers, but we. Uh, finally got to where we needed to be. So we're just asking you to approve the granting of an easement and allow me to execute. And there's actually even a copy of the proposed easement that you have as part of the uh, as part of the resolution. That'll be, you know, on record with the Registry of Deeds. Yes. Why a dollar? I don't understand that. It says a dollar on here. Um, because we are granting them, you know, something where, you know, it's a, it'll actually show up as a property, you know, as a, as a easement. So it's a, it's a property transaction, so um, so it's you know sort of it's a way of, it's a lawyer's way of saying for no consideration basically yeah. Um, Other questions on this one for the mayor, Councilor Dwight. Um, we have a sense of when this project is going to take place. Um, we don't accept. Uh, they've been wanting to do it since about last year, um, and so we will be obviously we'll be working with them to coordinate on the timing and and scheduling of it so it does not disrupt the parking lot. I was going to say, it yeah. seems that given its location, that it's, that'd be kind of difficult and that there would probably be uh, a substantial limitation of uh, parking. Do we get any offset from National Grid for the loss of parking revenue and also? Um, no, we did not. No, uh, we did not. Uh, is, I, my concern is that, of course, in order to trench that, mm -hmm. 
at least you'd have to eliminate all the, it looks like all the spaces uh, adjacent to uh, the Verizon property line up to that fence. It's going to be. I don't have. I should have had it with that with that detail of that building. But it's it's pretty close to where that um, Jersey barrier thing is. So we may have to adjust those. Oh, the Jersey barrier closer to. Oh, I see. The dotted line is representing in in the current. I think so. The dotted line is where the is where the line is going to run. So it actually runs closer to the Main Street buildings. Okay. Um, which has less parking and more dumpsters right. and. Um, Okay. So it's, not the, it's not in the main. Got it. Area. Okay. I was missing. All right. Yeah. I now. I now. Yeah, see that what line is, I think, um, something else. I don't know what that's to represent. It's I'm not sure. But, um, well, it, it, says it says it's the proposed primary, primary UG. Yeah. Uh, that's the proposed, and then the proposed conduit. So the it looks like. Yeah. The pro okay. Yeah. So it is closer to that to where the uh, that Jersey barrier that's between the Verizon building and the. In our lot, you know, there's there's parking on one side that's Verizon, parking on the other side that's ours. Um, so we'll certainly have to, you know, they recently, you may remember Columbia Gas recently trenched something through there, um, and it was a few, you know, it was a couple days of disruption. Right. Um, you know, they're going to basically cut a, you know, fairly yeah, narrow yeah. channel, um, and obviously they're going to have to have power disruption. So I don't think they're going to, you know, they're going to try to do that. Swiftly, so they can coordinate. They're incentivized so by delivering their power to. The that is true. Building. Since they're going to have to kill the power to the building, to the street, um, and then switch it over. Um, you know, this is first reading. I'm happy to go back and get more information between now and second reading. Right. So, if you can yep. get a sense of how long they anticipate yep. this project would be, and, and, yep. and no problem. how much, it, how much it will involve. Yep. Okay. Yep. Happy to do that, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor Bidwell. You had a question. I, I had two questions. One of them was that. That question, in, in particular, the foregone revenue. Was there any any provision for uh, for uh, addressing that in the agreement? And you've you've answered that. Um, the second was uh, the, there's a reference to the potential redevelopment of the parking lot. I was wondering if there's any, any news on on uh, the the potential. No, other than other than you know we are we didn't want to create a situation where, I mean, that was one lot in, for example, the, um, the parking study that was done back in 2015 um, as a potential area for a, a future structure, um, potentially. Um, and so that, that's why we want to, anytime we're doing anything in our parking lot, and you know, obviously we've also had AIAA come and say that we should look at our surface lots for potential, you know, infill development. So um, as we know from watching the Lumberyard project um, and having to spend a lot of money to move infrastructure out from under something, um, we just want to be cautious that we don't, you know, we don't box in a future right. redevelopment effort. So that's why we wanted to right. be clear that it's not that we have the right to ask them to move it. Obviously reasonable, within reasonable terms. Yeah. I guess I was, I was thinking more of the, the reference in that parking study the possible reconfiguration of traffic flow in cooperation with the Verizon lot and yeah we're in, was, we're we're in particularly yeah we've we are um, in conversation with Verizon it, it um, can't be well there's been a number of changes since that study took place not the least of which is the law offices buying the buying the um, um, mm. buying the latter day uh, Church of Latter Day Saints so, library yeah. reading room um, right, right. and redeveloping that and and taking all that parking for their law firm. Um, the original plan was well, their their goal was that you could enter on Masonic Street and leave on Center Street, but you'd have to bundle all of those various lots, including the TD Bank lot, the Verizon lot. We are in discussions with Verizon about a portion of using a portion of their lot. Um, uh, but they have also have security issues that they have to contend with um, and security. So we're, we're trying to work through that. Um, but we are working on that. But that's this, this was more just a long-term precaution, and which we would do any time we granted an easement that wasn't a city utility going through the property. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yep. Any other questions for the mayor on this one? Uh, hearing none, then all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. The next is 18.162. It's an order to authorize the Northampton School Committee to accept a gift of surplus technology equipment from Smith College. 
where Smith College has generously offered to donate surplus technology equipment to the Northampton Public Schools, valued at $17,270. And whereas the gift consists of Dell desktops, MacBook Pros, iMacs, LaserJet printers, and projectors, and whereas the Northampton School Committee voted to accept the donation at their meeting on June 14, 2018, whereas Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53A and a half provides that acceptance of gifts of tangible personal property require a vote of the City Council and approval of the Mayor. And now, therefore, it be ordered that the City Council hereby authorizes the Northampton School Committee to accept the gift of surplus technology equipment from Smith College with grateful appreciation. Do we have a motion of finance? Yeah. Second? Second. Uh, any questions for the Mayor on this one? The School Committee routinely accepts um, technology gifts from Smith College. Um, this is one that trips the $10,000 limit, um, which is why we have to come to City Council to get sort of City Council counter approval of the school committee. And uh, Smith College um, uh, tends to have really new technology, uh, and so they turn over their equipment a lot. So, um, and most of the stuff they're turning over is newer than the stuff we have in our schools. So, um, you know, we're happy to accept it, so that's why we're asking for the Council's approval. How old is the equipment? Um, I can get you the dates on it. I don't have that at my fingertips, um, but I know that they talked about it with um, Mr. Pagan, and they know what equipment it is. And you know, we would not accept it if it wasn't um, current equipment. I can try to get you that information. Yeah. Any other questions on this one? Hearing none, then all in favor of positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Well, all right. And uh, our final one for tonight is. 18127, it's an order to authorize the FY 2019 intermunicipal agreements. These are the things we do with the other communities. Order that, whereas Mass General Law Section 40, Section 4A allows for joint operation of public activities among governmental units, and whereas Mass General Law Section 40, um, Section 4A requires that such intergovernmental agreements be approved in a city by the City Council and Mayor, and whereas the City of Northampton provides services to and shares services with other municipalities. Therefore, pursuant to Mass General Law Section 40, uh, 4A, the City Council hereby authorizes the City of Northampton to enter into the following intermunicipal agreements for fiscal year 2019. All agreements are for one year unless they're specifically noted when I read them. A contract with the Town of Williamsburg for building inspection and zoning enforcement services, agreement to provide the Town of Williamsburg with services for a lump sum annual fee. Contract with the Town of Williamsburg for electrical inspection services, agreement to provide the Town of Williamsburg with services uh, the, and per, with permit fees turned over to the City of Northampton. Contract with the Town of Amherst, Hadley and East Hampton for municipal hearing officer services, agreement to provide municipal hearing officer services per Pursuant to Mass General Law Section 48A, uh, subsection 2C, to hear complaints related to alleged violations of state building codes or the state fire codes for a lump sum per agreement. Contract with the Town of Amherst, Chester, Chesterfield, Cummington, Hadley, Middlefield, Pelham, Williamsburg, Goshen, and Worthing to provide veteran service officer services. Uh, the agreement to provide these services to the various communities and assessments to individual towns per the agreement. Contract with the Town of Granby, Hadley, Amherst to provide sealer of weights and measures services. The agreement to provide these services to the various communities and assessments to the individual, individual towns as per those agreements. Contract with the Franklin County Regional Council of Governments to monitor and support the Greater Franklin County Economic Target Area. Contract with the Town of Amherst for kennel services. The Town of Amherst to provide kennel space for dogs in the custody of the Northampton Animal Control Officer per that agreement. Contract with Franklin Council of Governments uh, to partner with the City of Northampton through its health department relative to the following contracts. One, to provide services relative to the Hampshire Medical Reserve Corps, and two, to provide emergency management services for the Hampshire Public Health Emergency Preparedness, Preparedness Coalition. Contract with Amherst, South Hadley, Pelham, Ware, Belchertown, and East Hampton. Uh, the agreement to jointly create a coalition called the Hampshire Opioid Abuse Prevention Collaborative charged with the mobilizing of local boards of health, medical providers, educational facilities, social service agencies, community organizers, and others in Hampshire County to create sustainable policies, programs, and practices to change community ideas and expectations regarded, regarding opio opioid use and abuse, as well as to reduce the more uh, mobility and mortality rates 
that result from opioid use and abuse. Contract with Bay State Health Inc., the City of Springfield Department of Health and Human Services, Hamden County District Attorney, Northwest District Attorney, Hamden County Sheriff's Department, and Partners for Healthier Community Inc., the agreement to work cooperatively to create methods to collect, store, and aggregate data regarding opioid use and abuse in the region with the goal of analyzing trends, identifying short and long term intervention strategies. The contract with Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District, working under the oversight of the Massachusetts Department of Ag Agriculture, focused on mosquito surveillance and control. The city, through its health department, participates in this regional effort to assist Western Massachusetts communities with mosquito related health concerns. Contract with the town. Towns of Williamsburg, Goshen, Southampton, Chester, Huntington, and West Hampton, the agreement to provide a laser fish hosting services for an annual fee. A contract with the town of Amherst and Pelham to seek and accept grants where possible and otherwise to explore mutual, uh, mutually, uh, m the mutual advantages of electrical community aggregation. The following are agreements currently authorized by the city that have not expired. Contract with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission for EPA stormwater MS4 permit assistance that runs through March 2022. A paramedic intercept agreement with multiple towns and ambulance districts um, that runs through November 2041. Contract with the Pioneer Valley Transit Authority for senior transportation services that runs through November 2041. Contract with the Pioneer Valley Bike Share with municipal towns, agencies, and UMass that goes through FY 2021. Contract with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and multiple towns uh, for the Mass in Motion program that goes through FY 2020. Contract with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission for local planning technical assistance through the local district technical assistance and local technical assistance programs that runs through FY 2020. Contract with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission for traffic and transportation analysis through the Federal Department of Transportation Unified Work Program that also goes through 2020. And a contract with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission for historic preservation planning through the Community Preservation Act Program that runs through FY 2020. So do we have a motion for these in finance? Second. 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 Um, any questions so for the mayor? These are um, all renewals of agreements. And uh, by, by law, you know, both the other communities have to take them to their uh, select board or city councils, and we have to do it the same way. Um, my big takeaway is that Northampton's involved in a lot of really incredible regional partnerships and collaborations, on a lot, and we're the lead on many of those. So, um, so it gives you kind of a rundown of all of them. And, um, and so, again, this is an annual vote that we, start, we started doing the last several years and just doing them all at once um, at the beginning of the fiscal year as the agreement rolls over. Um, now, I will be asked to specific details of agreements and I'll try to- No, no, I, no, 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 I- I'm certainly I, provide you copies I, of all. I'm familiar with every single one of these and actually uh, uh, glad and excited to see the uh, electricity community aggregation included in this. I understand that, I mean, given the fact that we're I, I realize that the, the legal status and, and as far as applying for grants as a mutual community effort was a little complicated or there was some, there, there wasn't a lot of state law that gives you a lot of wiggle room, given that it's not really a formalized group in as such because they're three separate entities with three separate forms of governance. Um, does this, does this constitute as kind of an agreement with the, the two other communities, Pelham and Amherst? Yeah, we've, um, you know, we have, uh, we um, had a meeting of the, the you know, the uh, mayor and select board and town managers of the three communities. Um, you know, uh, there'd been a lot of citizen advocacy, as we know, at the energy and sustainability level and at the city council level. And so we have, um, the three communities have appointed uh, a working group that has been meeting on a regular basis in each of the three communities on a rotating basis and, um, and, uh, and trying to study this issue and, and think about it and think about, um, you know, if they could put together something you know, like Cape Light or, or something like it. So we are exploring it seriously. Um, and uh, Mr. Fiden and uh, Mr. Mason are representing the city on it and um, as well as some citizen members. Um, there's um, like Sam and, 
Adele may be involved still. Um, and so, uh, so that's what we're working on. And we wanted this agreement in place because one of the things that they're looking at is potentially, um, you know, applying for grants um, to try to do some of the feasibility analysis. So they wanted, we wanted to have this in place in case we wanted to do that. So the, our, our agreement on this is, is it echoed in the other two communities with similar agreements or? Yeah, we, this is just, a, this, we have sort of a, a shared agreement and we wanted to have this in place. Um, and UMass is very interested in this potentially as well, so that gives us a way, um, again, if we want to apply together. Um, it's not really an, it's not an organization or anything, but right. it's just three, well, three saying, communities really collaborating. Yes, exactly. Titles as such as exactly as an exploratory yeah. committee, but exactly. If you qualify for grants, I would imagine you have to put something in there that says what you are. So the exactly, yeah. That if we end up applying, uh, the three of us end up applying for something, this gives us that ability to do that. Um, just like when we applied for, you know, congestion mitigation monies for the bike share program. You know, even before bike share became a reality, even in the planning phase, we had a municipal agreement with the five communities and see so that we could begin doing the planning and apply for grants for the project so thank you uh, Councilor Bidwell uh, regarding town of Amherst kennel services do I recall that we approved funding for construction of you our did. kennel you did you certainly just did just curious yeah and we are um, we are uh, in the process of, of trying to uh, finalize a potential uh, location for that um, it in um, involves potentially some state-owned property, so we're having to work through DCAM um, and potentially an act of the legislature. So um, it's taking us a little longer, but we are working with a designer and have done, uh, we, um, the police chief and the animal control officer and Dave Pomerantz have visited a number of area facilities and, um, and have some uh, rough schematics of what we need for Northampton, and so we're just trying to finalize the location of it um, so it is we are moving forward with it but obviously we wanted to renew our agreement with Amherst so that we would have a facility um, to bring dogs to yep any other questions on uh, the agreement? hearing none then all in favor of a positive <coughs> recommendation finance please say aye. aye aye any opposed good and I know of no new business so uh, a motion to adjourn would be in order move to adjourn second all in favor aye thank you and thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll return to regular order and we'll go to public hearings. And I'll make an announcement of a public hearing. This is in accordance with the provisions of Section 22, Chapter 166 of the General Laws. A public hearing will be held on July 12, 2018, at 705 in the City Council Chambers here at 212 Main Street on the petition of National Grid. Rise New England to erect poles and wires upon, along, under, or across one or more public ways. This is poll petition number 26019356, Cook Avenue. So that announcement has been made. Um, I have no updates. Are there any one minute announcements from members of the council this evening? Any updates from committee chairs? Uh, Mr. Mayor, do you have other communications to present this evening? No, uh, uh, we were just trying to find, figure out how we ended up doing finance when we did finance. So well, we had a counselor who had an important personal commitment, so I moved it up for that reason. Understood. Okay, so thanks for the indulgence. Uh, so now we are at uh, resolutions. This is R18128. Um, originally, a resolution calling for an end to the separation of immigrant children from their parents. Uh, I would like to, I know it's a little bit irregular, I'd like to have a motion on this resolution before I read it, if I may. So moved up. Okay. Made, is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, there are substantial amendments to be offered by some of the sponsors. So is there any objection to waiving reading of the original resolution? Hearing none, what I'd like to do is um, read the proposed amendments from the sponsors. And at that time, I'd, afterwards, I'd ask for a motion to amend the new language. Uh, and we'll start from that point. Okay? Um, so this is a resolution uh, denouncing and demanding an end to President Trump's zero-tolerance immigration policy. 
Whereas the Department of Homeland Security announced that in the six week period between April 19th. Can you just maybe tell all of the counselors that they have a copy, yeah. hard copy on there? Does just everyone have the new amendments? Sorry, thank you. So whereas the Department of Homeland Security announced that in the six week period between April 19th, 2018 and May 31st, 2018, it separated 1,995 immigrant children from their parents at the southern U.S. border, with many thousands more separated before that period and since. And whereas this practice by the United States Government of ICE and Border Patrol, agents separating children from their parents and families with no government mechanism for reuniting them is immoral, abhorrent, cruel, and inhumane. And whereas the children who have been separated from their parents are being held in deplorable conditions, sometimes in cages and with bottled water and bags of potato chips as their only sustenance. And whereas the Trump administration's zero tolerance immigration policy and the practice of separating children from their parents has caused immigrant parents to live in terror of having their children torn from them and their children to live in terror of being separated from their families in such a manner. And whereas separating children from their families is condemned throughout the world as a crime against children and constitutes a form of torture for both the children and their parents. And whereas the practice of separating immigrant children from their parents has been deemed, quote, government-sponsored child abuse by Dr. Colleen Kraft, the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And whereas the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, Zayed Raid Al Hussein, has called, called for an immediate halt to this practice, stating that, quote, the thought that any state would seek to deter parents by inflicting such abuse on children is unconscionable. And whereas religious leaders representing diverse faiths issued a joint statement condemning this practice saying, quote, tearing children away from parents who have made a dangerous journey to provide a safe and sufficient life for them is unnecessarily cruel and detrimental to the well-being of parents and children. And whereas the separation of children from their parents can serve as a lifelong trauma and can be permanently debilitating, with this kind of trauma being linked to serious mental, physical, and community health issues, such as acute and post-traumatic stress disorder, harmful drug and alcohol use, depression, anxiety, suicidality, and higher mortality rates. And whereas trauma of this nature lasts not just throughout these children's and parents' lifetimes, but into the lives of su successive generations, as we see from horrifying historical precedents, such as during slavery in the United States, the, tri the trail of tears, and the concentration and death camps of the Holocaust. And whereas President Trump's response to the public outcry against separating immigrant children from their parents was to issue a June 20th, 2018 executive order affording Congress an opportunity to address family separation, calling for the detention of immigrant families as a unit. And whereas this move on the President's part is, quote, not family reunification, um, it, rather it is family incarceration and this is not a victory, end quote. Uh, the, and whereas the Trump administration is accelerating the aggressive criminalization and prosecution of the parents of these children, who are in many cases facing up to 20 years in prison for, quote, illegal entry, so that immigrant children could remain incarcerated with their parents for very long periods of time, thus violating a 2015 court decision on children's rights called the Flores Agreement that limits the ability of the government to detain children for more than 20 days. And whereas, despite the executive order, the Trump administration currently has no plans to reunite the thousands of children already separated from their parents, some of whom have already been deported. And whereas the federally sponsored immigration raids that target these parents and children in their homes, at work, and in their neighborhoods are conducted with, without respect for civil and constitutional rights. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of Northampton, Massachusetts, condemns uh, the shameful policy 
of separating immigrant children from their parents and families, the incarceration of immigrant children and their parents, and the Trump administration's zero tolerance immigration policy, and calls for the restitution, calls for restitution for and reunification of the families who have been affected by it. Be it further resolved that the City Council of Northampton, Massachusetts calls for bipartisan support for the urgent passage of U.S. Senate Bill S-3036, the Keep Families Together Act, introduced by Senator Dianne Feinstein and co-sponsored by Massachusetts Senators Elizabeth Warren and Ed Markey. S-3036 prohibits the separation of children from their guardians unless, quote, danger of abuse or neglect at the hands of the parent or legal guardian end quote, can be proven through multiple evidence-based and trauma-informed steps that safeguard, quote, a strong presumption in favor of family unity, end quote. Be it further resolved that the City Council of Northampton, Massachusetts calls for federal immigration policy that is guided by humane and carefully considered laws that help protect the people who come to the United States seeking asylum and relief. Be it further resolved that the administrative assistance of the City Council shall cause a copy of this resolution to be sent to President Donald Trump, United States Homeland Security Secretary Kristen Nielsen, United States Attorney General Jefferson Sessions, U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren, U.S. Senator Ed Markey, U.S. Senator Dianne Feinstein, Congressman James McGovern, and Massachusetts Governor Charles Baker. Is there a motion to adopt that amendment? Uh, so move. Is there a second? Second. Um, any discussion on adopting the amendment before we return to the main order? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? So <coughs> the order is amended, and I would ask for discussion on the resolution. <laughs> Councillor Klein. Um, so we've adopted the amendment, but I just want to speak to it briefly, which is that uh, from the day that we wrote this to the day that um, till today there was a change and the executive order was um, issued by President Trump. Um, and that kind of, we felt like it, it behooved us to revisit the resolution and really figure out how we are addressing the fact that um, Technically, children won't be separated from their families under this executive order. However, um, the zero tolerance policy, immigration policy, remains in place. Uh, the concept of reunifying these or, or keeping the families together um, when a parent is arrested is um, problematic both legally and conceptually uh, because children could be incarcerated with their parents for many, many years, and it will violate uh, uh, court decisions that say that children can't be held more than 20 days. So there are just so many different pieces that kind of shifted with the executive order that we felt needed addressing. We also really wanted to have stronger language. Um, I appreciated um, Chelsea Klein's public comment today about uh, addressing reunification, which we did add in the first uh, resolution at the end um, that we called for the reunification of the families. Uh, there are literally, I think, um, I read different reports, but as many as 6,000 children over this period of time since April that have been separated from their families. Some reports say as many as 8,000. Many of those children's parents have returned to, have been returned to forcibly to their countries of origin, meaning that these children are incarcerated um, and their parents aren't available for reunification. There are no <coughs> plans in place uh, that have been publicized for reunification of all of those children. So those are all of the things that we really wanted to address with the amendment, and um, I think this is a resolution that really speaks for itself. It's quite lengthy and detailed. Um, and everything is footnoted because there are uh, different reports that you can read, so you'll know where all of this information came from. And uh, I'm happy, we're all happy. The, I want to co -thank, co thank my co sponsors, Marianne Labarge and Jean Louise Shera. Um, and we're happy to answer questions if anybody has them about kind of the details because it is so laden with information and details. Council Shera. Um, <clears throat> thank you also to my co-sponsors and um, 
as Councillor Klein was saying, there, there was sort of a brief question about whether we should withdraw this resolution because it, at least the executive order sort of changes the conversation. Um, but I, I feel very strongly that we, um, we need to do everything we can to not whitewash this very shameful moment, moment in our history. And, uh, and we really need to mark it for what it is. Um, in my mind, reunification is the very, very least that should be done. And um, as uh, Councilor Klein just said, there isn't even any plan for that. Um, additionally, I don't, I don't want it to take decades or 50 years or a century for some formal apology from a future Congress um, for these atrocities when this current administration is done and dead and the actual people who have suffered can no longer receive that apology, um, as cold comfort as that apology would be. And, um, and that the, these, those that are responsible for this aren't held accountable in any way. Um, and that has been the case in the past with the Trail of Tears or the imprisonment of Japanese Americans where uh, an apology doesn't come for, for decades and decades. Um, there's really, there's no way to undo this trauma or make it right. And I don't, I don't even know what justice would be for this situation. But um, I would really like it realized for these families, and I would like all the needed resources put towards recovery for them for what has been inflicted on them. And I don't, uh, I don't expect that will happen, but I just think it's important to speak as loudly as we can about this and not accept sort of this, um, this executive order as a, as a fix for this horrible moment in history. Council of the Barge. Yes, um, I had something written up and we have changed the language on it. Um, I just feel that this is the moment when the Trump administration has gone too, too far. And the part on this move on the president's part is not family reunification. Rather, it is family incarceration and this is not a victory. And I find this is not a victory. I find, and I still find this to be one of the most shameful, shameful episodes in the United States history. Before, I was very upset about the children at the airport, but this is the most shameful that I've ever seen, ever seen in history. I find it to be child abuse, and even if they now are with their parents, and I agree with you, Counselor Klein, they might be with them, but how long? How long? That's another question. Where are they going to put them? That's another question. I find this to be very discriminating. We, all of us, are someone's child. Many of us are mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, grandparents. We're aunts and uncles. We're friends and neighbors who watch out for each other's children. Just. Seeing what we've seen on TV, children sleeping on floors, kept in prisons, locked in what can only be described as cages, and we've seen it with our own eyes. I don't think, and if President Trump thinks this is a victory for him, I don't agree with him, because I think that the children who have gone through this, they will never forget this, never. And I wanna thank you for organizing this, and hopefully the children will be safe, they will be with their parents, but I think this will be watched very, very carefully. And I also feel that no politician should be able to hide from these images and stories of families being separated, and let's hope we never see this again. It's, it's very valuable. Councilor Dwight. The, um, you know, we're a nation that actually at least pays lip service to the notion of uh, child abduction. I get amber alerts every time a child is um, taken by someone. Um, and it comes out over everyone's phones, it goes over the television. This is a wholesale state-sponsored child abduction. Mm -hmm. It's virtually, I mean, it's, it, it, the fact that we would devote so much care and energy about the, the abduction of one child in one circumstance, yet at the same time sort of be numbed by the fact that thousands of children are being taken from their parents for what 
essentially constitutes a misdemeanor. It's the equivalent of getting up, being pulled over for speeding with your child in the car and the police taking your child from you. Part of many of these children are actually, because they can't figure out, they can't necessarily wear them, they're not enough uh, vacant Walmarts to warehouse them in, um, they're being put into foster care. They're being sent all over the country to be put into foster care. Foster care with well-meaning families, I'm sure, a, a system that's over overburdened to date now and underfunded by this very same government. And there, there are children who are being sent to homes of people they do not know and do not know the prospects of the future. That is kidnapping. That is kidnapping. That's stealing children from families. So our revulsion, I, I think, is evident here and it's evident in the resolution. It just as a nation, it just doesn't seem to be high enough. It doesn't seem to reflect the magnitude and the obscenity of this crime. And it is a crime. And I, I, you know, I'm grateful to the sponsors for uh, drafting this resolution. I fully expected a resolution at this point. Um, the, this actually, oddly enough, has unified the nation in some way, in a bipartisan way, uh, to the point where um, Jeff Sessions' church is talking about expelling him from the church for citing biblical, a biblical passage that he misquoted out of context to use to justify this action. Um, the, it's, our capacity for shame seems to uh, be diminished by the magnitude of the crimes that we are now committing or is being committed in our name. And, and that's the most, that's very chilling, that's very disturbing, the prospect that we've come to this point. If this happened 10 years ago, the level of out outrage would be even more intense. It would just be too brutal a shock to even comprehend. Yeah, now it's just another in a string of grotesque um, behavior and conduct by a, a, an administration that we bear responsibility for. It exists by our, <laughs> by our permission, through our permission. So I'm grateful the resolution here is saying that you do not have our permission. Um, and I'm grateful for our, our two senators who are also saying em very emphatically that they reject this and call for at least a change in policy, but there really should be a call for criminal liability, culpability, accountability. And um, I do hope that day of reckoning comes and can't come soon enough for me. So thank you again for the resolution. Obviously, I think I'm inclined to favor it with a, an eye. Thank you. Any other members of the council? Councilor Bigelow. Uh, I, I too thank the, the sponsors for the effort that went into this. Um, some of you may be aware that this, this week, uh, a woman by the name of Irene Butter, a uh, Holocaust survivor, has been in town. She's a native of Ann Arbor, well, she's a native of Berlin and then Amsterdam. She's written a remarkable book, Shores to Shores, with co-authors John Bidwell and Chris Holloway. They've been making the rounds to speaking engagements. Um, and I've read the book and I've heard her speak and it occurred to me uh, in reading the book uh, that even in the unspeakable atrocities uh, and assaults and travesties uh, that she and her family were subjected to along with others who wound up ultimately in Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. Even with everything that they suffered, their families were never separated. And it just, it just struck me that, not to, not to extend this comparison too far, but it struck me that in, in those unspeakable circumstances, even then, uh, babies were kept with their parents. Uh, teenagers were kept with their parents. Uh, so it just it just really struck, uh, that really brought home the, the magnitude of this atrocity. Any other members of the council? <coughs> Councilor Klein. Uh, 
Um, the the co-sponsors are hoping for two readings on this um, today because we would like to really expedite getting this to the places that it needs to go at the federal level. Noted. Any other conversation? Um, okay. Uh, ask for a roll call, please. Yes. 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 So motion to spend rules. Uh, so moved. Is there a second. second. Any discussion on the suspension of rules to allow two readings? If not, all those in favor of suspending rules say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Is there a motion? Second, second reading. Made. Second. Is there a second? Seconded by Councillor Carney. Made by Councillor Dwight. Any discussion on second reading? So when we're ready, we have a roll call. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. 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 Councilor yes. Nash. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Yes. Okay. So the resolution is approved in second reading. Thank you very much. Um, we now move to the consent agenda, which contains the following items. I'll read them, and if councilors have any they wish to remove, please state it at the time. First is the approval of uh, the minutes of May 3rd, 2018, and May 17th, 2018. Um, the second. second. Uh, we still have more items on the agenda uh, to read first, um, and that will be appointments to various boards. Voting on these will be the equivalent of referring them to the Committee on City Services, correct? Okay. Um, they are the following people to the following bodies. Uh, to the Agricultural Commission, John Bobala of 25 Ferry Road for a term expiring June 2021. To the Council on Aging, Jerry Ann Butler of 46 Autumn Drive for a term expiring June 2021. Uh, to the Arts Council, Courtney Hummel of 320 Elm Street uh, as, uh, for a term expiring June 2019, as well as Kristen Mara of 41 Williams Street uh, for a term expiring June 2021, and Lori Steiner of 18 Ridgewood Terrace for a term expiring June 2020. To the Parks and Recreation Commission, Kristen Dardano of 281 Elm Street for a term expiring June 2021. To the Public Shade Tree Commission, Robert Postel of 44 Washington Avenue for a term expiring June 2021. And to the Transportation and Parking Commission, Gary Hartwell of 419 Riverside Drive for a term expiring June 2021. Um, and there is a note by the License Commission. Please note that the term for Brian Campanelli, who was approved for the appointment at the June 7th City Council meeting was mistakenly listed as a three-year term. It should be a six-year term and will expire on June tw uh, 2024. So I take that as a referral of the question of appointing Brian Campadelli for a six-year term uh, expiring June 2024th to the License Commission. Move acceptance of the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay. Uh, there's no discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The consent agenda is adopted. Uh, we have already uh, recessed for finance, and so we'll move to financial orders. And the first is 18.124, order to grant utility easement under Masonic Street parking lot. Is there a motion? Is there a second? Uh, second. Any discussion on approving this financial order on first reading? If not, uh, I'd ask for a roll call. Okay, Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Clark. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 The order is approved. 18.126. In order to authorize Northampton School to accept a gift of surplus technology equipment from Smith College. Second. Okay, and second, any discussion on the order? Roll call, please. Yes. 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 That order is approved on first reading. 18.127, order to authorize fiscal year 2019 intermunicipal agreements. Is there a second? Second. Second. And second, any discussion on the order? Roll call, please. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Sherrill? Yes. Councilor Goodwill? Yes. Councilor Carney? 
Yes. 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 Okay, that order is approved in first reading as well. Now some orders on financial orders on second reading. First, 18.108, in order to approve the fiscal year 2019 general fund budget. Second. Second. Made and seconded. Um, this was voted on uh, two weeks ago in city council after holding hearings on uh, the city on the budget as submitted by the mayor as we were required to under the charter we held hearings uh, on two days in fact before we voted on this the first time um, but is there any further discussion on approving the budget tonight okay I think that this is a budget that um, does very well for the, the great constraints that the city of Northampton labors under uh, many of which we cannot control um, and actually some of the public comment tonight referenced some of the pressures that are that come to play on our city and in our on our public school district in particular um, but I like to thank the the mayor and the, and the finance director for doing such uh, diligent work on this book uh, if there's no other discussion I ask for a roll call Yes. 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 Uh, the budget is approved by the council. Uh, now, 18.109 orders to approve uh, fiscal year 2019 enterprise funds. Second. Okay. This contains three enterprise funds that we are approving, if I'm not mistaken. Um, any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 As approved, there are two ordinances that have not been referred. Um, is there a motion to refer both of these? Um, 18.123 in order to amend Chapter 312-110 of the Code Book and 18. Point one two five in ordinance to amend chapter three twelve dash one oh four and a motion to refer both of these as a group to legislative matters. So moved. Second. Is there a second. Okay. Um, should these go <coughs> also to the Transportation Parking Commission? I'd ask the chair of I think they probably should if they haven't been, since they both concern parking. Resounding <laughs> sure <laughs> from the chair. Yeah, send them over. Yeah, I'd, my motion would include sending okay. transportation and parking, okay. as well as the legislative matters. The Human Rights Commission, um, the Youth Commission, anywhere else? No. Community okay. resources. Community resources <laughs> always no, no, no. a favorite <laughs> of the council. Now, the transportation, <laughs> parking commission, and legislative matters makes sense. So that is the motion on the floor for both of these things. Any discussion on the referral? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, any abstentions? Those are referred. Um, now, ordinances on first reading. First, 18.096, an, uh, an ordinance uh, regarding road takings, uh, which I will now read. This is an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing that Chapter 350-6.3, that the Code of Ordinances of the City be amended by creating a provision to allow buildable parcels affected by road takings to continue to be buildable after such takings so long as minimum standards are met. So this would amend uh, section 350-6.3 subsection D. Um, and I will just read the, the new language in its entirety. Um, well, it wouldn't be so burdensome to, to note the changes. So we would be adding the phrase, effective as of January 1st, 2018. 
um, and then the existing language, when land is taken by the city or the commonwealth for public purposes not specified in section 350-6.3c above, and when such conveyance renders the remainder of the lot, we add the word newly, non-conforming, or as to a, we add the word legally, pre-existing non-conforming lot, increases its non-conformity with the dimensional requirements of this zoning ordinance, that remainder lot shall be considered to be a protected non-conforming lot subject to the provisions of section 350-9. Excuse me, just for clarification, Please. the entire subsection is an addition and those highlighted additions are planning board amendments that were made following the oh. public hearing. So it's that clear. wasn't clear, okay. My, my mistake. So the entire subsection D, there's, there is no section D. So. Right, it's not existing. Okay, so everything I read is new. Um, and so subsection D, the new subsection this ordinance would create, contains three of its own subsections. Number one, if the remainder lot, it is not held in common with any adjoining parcels. Um, and two, if the remainder lot has a minimum of 3,750 square feet of lot size, 50 feet of frontage, and a minimum of 10 feet of setback uh, from all property lines, regardless of the zoning district. And third, if the remainder lot is in a commercial or industrial district, 10 foot uh, uh, front setback requirement is measured from either a building or a parking lot, whichever is closer to the front lot line. That is the ordinance. Is there a motion to approve this on Make first reading? To approve. Made any, uh, a second? Second. Second. So I would like to ask either the mayor or our senior land use planner, whoever. My massive planning staff that's here yeah. with me tonight. Uh, no, Wayne is out of town. Uh, oh, Carolyn's here. Oh, Carolyn. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You've already volunteered. You can't get can, I'm happy to. I'm happy to introduce it, and then she can talk about the technical part of it. Thank you. Um, um, this actually arose because we were looking at um, work on Damon Road. Um, we're working on a major reconstruction project for Damon Road, um, which requires us, like with Route 66, you remember, um, and any major state projects, they um, uh, Hopefully, make the city do all the land takings because it's so much fun and so inexpensive. Um, even though the state's paying for the project, uh, they make us do the um, all the surveying and all of the outreach and all of the either construction easements or, or whatever. Um, and so, what sometimes happens in these cases is that bec due to the taking, we're reducing the lot size of a person's lot and basically. Is bring, some, in some cases, bringing it into non-compliance with zoning or lessening the size of the lot. Um, so um, this is actually uh, an, an, you know, an, an approach we've seen used in other communities um, where we're basically saying that in those cases where due to a city or state taking of land, um, we, we reduce your lot size that you know, triggers some kind of a zoning that it kind of grandfathers you or creates a pre-existing non-conformity for that lot. Um, so that's sort of the, the 30,000 foot view of what this does. And then if you want the nitty gritty, uh, Carolyn can give you the backstory on that. I'm assuming you guys had a, a discussion about this at Legislative Matters. Yeah. Um, does the chair want to? Well, the chair was absent. Okay. So I will defer to the co-chair who presided. I don't. Um, I don't have anything. I think that Carolyn's going to be able to answer the questions better. I'm not sure that we had okay. a very substantive discussion. That's but okay. We just wanted to others on the committee. Was there anything that we need to note here? To like hear from Carolyn. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, I think just in terms of the details, um, um, when a taking does occur, the Commonwealth is obligated to pay for those strips of land, but it doesn't necessarily account for then the remaining land and what that um, um, land can be used for. So uh, there are situations in which there's just, um, it sort of falls through the cracks and the land becomes 
really um, unusable or, or then, um, and, and it's not compensated in that manner. It's just, there's just compensation for the actual strip of land that's taken. So this um, provides, you know, cushion, so to speak, for those folks who are subject to road widenings or um, other public action for taking land. Thank you. Um, can I ask you just a couple questions? Um, so is, is 50 feet of frontage, is that the minimum you'll find in frontage in anywhere in the city? Is that why we have that? Yes, it's the minimum. It's also 50 feet of frontage is the um, standard, statutory standard across the common <coughs> for um, uh, particular <coughs> single family house lots. Mm -hmm. um, there are provisions for what's called a single lot exemption. So that's also a basis for using that number. Thank you. And another question I have is this would be effective as of January 1st, 2018. So retroactively, was that intentional? Um, just had to pick a date and wanted it to be this year. So it could be any date in 2018, really. And January 1 is a round number. I think it should be in the future after today. Would that be a problem? No. Okay. Not from my perspective. No. Okay, great. Uh, Councilor Dwight. It doesn't exist, uh, there already exists something equivalent of uh, essentially doing frontage averaging in, in other non-conforming uses. I, I remember doing this in the neighborhood for frontage setbacks. Uh, we measured um, several houses on the same street who actually were already non-conforming. Yeah. And someone who wanted to build their porch out, uh, we didn't know what to do for them. And then I discovered that at least we had an allowance that if we could um, do an average of the uh, the difference or, or of the non-conforming difference that they could they could move up to that line on their properties that that still stand um, so we have some of those provisions left those are targeted for residential uses only this applies to sort of all property in the city okay. that's number one number two we've also eliminated some of those um, dimensional averaging um, provisions as we've adjusted the zoning to sort of um, reflect what the neighborhood is already. So we've reduced some of those setbacks um, and lot sizes anyway. And so it sort of um, eliminated the need for using lot size averaging. Okay. So in this case then, since the conditions don't exist yet, so you can't do the averaging anyway, this is in anticipation of the prospect of, of uh, a land taking that would actually establish something like this so that someone doesn't have to right. do this retroactively. Okay. Thanks. Other questions? Council? Uh, to Councilor O'Donnell's point, I, I too wondered if it would cause any problems to have this go retroactive. So are, are we say, should we say August 1 since it needs to come back for a second reading? I think so. That, yeah. Would you like to make that motion at this time? I'd like to move that uh, the January 1 reference be changed to an August 1 reference. Is there a second to that amendment? Second. Uh, yeah, I, actually, isn't all of this an amendment? We're amending the ordinance, which would amend the code. Okay. I'll, yeah, I'll second that. Yeah. Amendment. What date is it being moved to August? August, August, August 1. 1. August 1. Um, any discussion on the amendment? Um, yeah, sorry if I was unclear when introducing the ordinance. The whole section is new. I thought we were only amending an, addition, uh, an existing section, but the whole section is new. So uh, the motion is to amend um, to change January 1st to August 1st. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? So that is amended. Thank you. Um, That's true. It's always weird to have. Well, that was why I asked because it seems like if there was some kind of zoning reason why you were I think, well I think it was to clarify that it's from this point forward and so that um, so because I, there are you know we could go back for years and years um, for things that happened the takings that occurred um, that we don't previous takings yeah. so. I think the city solicitor suggested that we have a, a date that was current, so it was clear that it's from this point forward. This takes effect. Yeah. Council the barge. Yeah, Caroline, question. I mean, this is perfect. 
I've had engineers. Excellent. A big question, which the mayor did bring up, like a situation on West Dampton Road, on eminent domains that were taken on property and so forth like that. I have it in writing where Mass Highway guaranteed that property pens would be replaced on the reconstruction mm -hmm. on, on that road. And we waited and waited. People who lost their property pens, they wouldn't back it. So how do we protect Mayor and Carolyn? People who are having something like this being done, where property is being taken, property pens are being removed, the cost just to replace property pens is not cheap. So how does the city step in and protect people's property with this? Because I have it in writing. And then they said, well, nobody came to them. They guaranteed, guaranteed that they would make sure the property pens would be replaced. And some of them never have. I just want to clarify, is this question about takings under eminent domain? It's, yeah. Or is it a different subject? But even so, it's still a big, big question here. But it's not to do with because you're talking, Councillor, you're talking about property here. I think um, what you're to make sure I understand what you're asking that um, once uh, once uh, property boundaries are changed through taking from by the Commonwealth or the city, um, the new property lines reflecting that. Um, smaller lot owned by the property owner should be bounded by pins so that everyone and the property owner in particular understands where that new property boundary is. Is that what you're asking about? Yes. And, why? and is there a way to ensure that those pins get located at the new boundary right. line? Yeah, I mean, I don't have an answer for that. I think that's clearly part of the um, construction project at hand, and I don't, you know, there's typically overseeing engineers that are supposed to ensure that the project gets completed the way that it was designed. Um, but we don't necessarily have control when it's a DOT project. We don't really, as a city, have control over um, every detail. They run the project and make sure that, and are supposed to make sure that um, um, all those T's get crossed and Good luck. I's get <laughs> We can inquire when the construction happens. We can certainly inquire. Because yeah. the pins literally get dug up. They get, they get dug up as part of the construction. Okay. So. Um, now, any other questions? So the, um, this, the first subsection, the remainder lot, uh, is not held in common with any adjoining parcels. Uh, can you explain that? Sure. So. Um, the, that relates to what's um, considered, what's referred to as the law, um, the merger doctrine, um, in which if you own abutting parcels and you need both of those to comply with zoning, um, you look at both parcels together. You, you can't just, even though there may be a line in between, um, indicating different lots if they're owned by the same property owner than those you. you um, the idea is that um, those can't be split out to create non-conforming lots, but they have to be maintained com um, combined to, in order to meet those minimum zoning requirements. So this is really um, trying to make sure that we're not trying to intercede or make changes to that merger um, doctrine, but that that still applies. I don't know how often this would happen, but if you had um, two parcels that you consider to be merged and one were affected by a taking and became non-conforming. Um, does that make it, in theory, impossible to sell for the purposes of building something that you could build on it if it were conforming? Since it was considered a joint, I'm just wondering yeah. what's the... So let's say you had two lots at, at some point um, that you at the point at which you purchased, they were both buildable. Mm -hmm. And there was a taking mm -hmm. that, um, if you looked at the lots separately as separate building lots, made one um, not, no longer compliant, mm -hmm. 
you still have the ability to create one complying lot by merging by through that merger doctrine. And it's the same thing, same issue that happens when zoning changes over time. Um, there's a provision in the Zoning um, Act that um, allows for um, separation of lots within a small window once mm -hmm. a zoning changes to make lots non, um, lot sizes change. Mm -hmm. But once you are outside that window, then those lots merge and you can no longer separate them out. But presumably, you know, when if something like that happens, mm -hmm. part of the negotiation with um, the Commonwealth or the city is looking at that value. If you take a sliver of my land that I no longer have two building lots and I'm down to one, then presumably the value of that taking is removing <coughs> the ability to build on both lots. This seems strange that if you had a parcel that's affected by a taking, this ordinance would seek to preserve its, its usefulness, in a sense, by uh, classifying it as a non-conforming lot. But if it were considered attached to another parcel, that suddenly would not be possible under the ordinance. Well, it's because you still have a building lot. This is mm -hmm. affecting people who are just essentially left with mm -hmm. no ability to use their property. OK. Um, does that provision come from the, the planning department, or is that Added that's a state. That's de, that's um, been determined through case law across the Commonwealth. The, the issue of merger is not something generated in our office. It's. But saying that if there's a merge, there are two merged lots, then it doesn't apply to either. Essentially, that's that's not case law, or, right? That's something. That's just something you wanted to do. To oh, to limit this provision. The, mm -hmm. Yeah, the first um, subsection. That's true, except that we wouldn't, if, if this language weren't in here, yeah. we would be applying that anyway. We'd say, well, you still have a building lot uh -huh. because you, your lots merge for the purposes of creating a buildable parcel. Okay. And this is just sort of putting it out there so that people are no um, mm -hmm. up front. It's not, mm. we're not changing anything. We're just sort of being truthful and in what okay. the considerations are anyway okay. under the Zoning Act. Maybe I'm, okay. It just seems like if you have two building lots and suddenly one's not buildable anymore and the first one was something you perhaps w was valuable to you as an investment, I'm just wondering, wondering what's achieved by exempting s those situations just because it's adjoining a different lot. Well, it's very comparable to when we come in and make a zoning change and the zoning then, for instance, the lot size requirement goes up from, let's say it was 12,000 square feet for a minimum lot size, and then for environmental reasons um, or um, in order to protect um, certain environmental features or um, groundwater, for instance, we might say the minimum lot size is 80,000 square feet. All of a sudden, if you have two 12,000 square foot lots that you own together, um, you, they're no longer two separate building lots. Um, because now the minimum lot size is 80,000 square feet. So it's just mirroring what already um, are the standard provisions under the Zoning Act in terms of how we treat um, changes in lot sizes. Okay. Thank you. A any other questions? Okay. Shall we vote on this? Actually, I'm sorry, we got one oh. more question. Councilor Dwight. Um, in, in takings, of course, Compensation, they are the the property owner is compensated by enacting this. Is, does this modify the values? Does it enhance the values for uh, um, uh, compensation from the state? Um, I think that it may um, it may. Um, it may affect some compensation for parcels because um, then it could be there could be a situation in which a parcel is still buildable once a taking is made, and so the compensation maybe doesn't have to cover the entire value of a building parcel. It, could, it only needs to cover you know, that sliver. Um, 
Um, but again, I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't know a whole lot about how they assess value right. for slivers that are taken. So I don't want to. Um, well, obviously, I mean, if, if this weren't in force, if this didn't exist by the time they make the offer on the taking, whereas functionally they're depleting the entire value of many properties. Obviously, the compensation problem is bigger. Right. I would imagine. Right. The equivalent of saying, you know, yes, your your business is now non-conforming in that uh, the, the compensation would reflect that, whereas actually we have legislation now that allows it <coughs> to not adversely impact our ability to develop or build beyond what they already experience. So. I can say my overall goal for this is to not have vacant unusable land right mm -hmm. no I no I hear that I just it's it's actually more of an academic puzzle yeah. and it's not it, in the end it, it makes more sense to do this and and on some level I'm asking is sort of like a gaming issue for the property owners that we might we might effectively provide them an opportunity to negotiate a higher value on their property mm -hmm. of course now that I've said this aloud <laughs> That's true. And, and then wait until after the fact after the after the compensations have been doled out to a, to a, but that's Damon Road specific. That's that's yeah. enhancing. Yeah. Okay. I've already I've already talked myself out. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I would just move in in that first section that we uh, strike the word it. If the remainder of the lot, get rid of it, is not held in common. Is there a second to that? Motion? Second. Discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any abstentions? So that's it. Um, any other discussion on the ordinance? Um, okay. Roll call, please. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Fine. Yes. Councilor White. Yes. Councilor Labar. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sheriff. Yes. Okay, the ordinance approved in first reading, and it will come back in July for its possible effective date in August, <laughs> uh, as opposed to the past. Um, now we're at 18.098, an ordinance to delete sewer use from uh, Chapter 260 of the Northampton Code. This is a second. Motion to approve this. Uh, second. second. Made and seconded. Any discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor White. Yes. Councilor Fine. Yes. 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 We all vote? Okay, that's passed. Yeah. Second reading. Any new business tonight? Yep. Motion to adjourn. I do. Second. All second. All those favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs>